start off by talking about regular old computing, which I sometimes call classical computing. And one of the reasons we call it classical computing is if you think about it, computing today operates under the laws of classical physics or Newtonian physics. And what I'm going to talk about today is a computer that leverages directly the laws of quantum mechanics to do a calculation. So it's a little bit different, uh, significantly different than classical computing. A um, little bit of my background, I am a classical computing guy. I'm an old guy in the computing business. I started working at uh, digital equipment right out of college. Some of you may remember DEC. They were a leader in uh, the mini computer business. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a computer guy and I'm a computer nerd. I love computers. I love uh, computing technology. And about five years ago, I got a call from a recruiter about an opportunity to work at a company that had built a quantum computer. And I had the sort of conventional wisdom or thought I had the uh, knowledge that quantum computing was really something that was 20 years away. This was five years ago. And um, wasn't when, when I started doing Google search, I'm on the phone talking to the recruiter, you know, I Google search about this like we all do when we're talking to recruiters about the opportunity. I, I really wasn't interested because it didn't seem like it was real. But I, I, I wound up going out to this company in uh, Vancouver, Canada. And I fell in love with what they were doing, the earnestness of the team, the, um, the, the, the technology that they had, uh, had built. Uh, it was like a, a, a gem, I thought, in, in, in the wilderness. And I really wanted to be part of the company. And five years later, I'm even more excited about the potential of quantum computing. So today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about why I think this is an exciting field. Um, a little bit about quantum computing in general. I'm not going to focus just on you know, what D-Wave does because we do a particular type of quantum computing. Um, but uh, I, I want to give you an overview of quantum computing and then talk a little bit about what D-Wave does specifically. But let's just reflect upon, I was just thinking about this earlier in, in the computing space. You know, we all carry around these devices. This is maybe a couple of years old now, an uh, iPhone 5S. This thing has two, two cores in it. Run, each core runs at 1.5 gigahertz, and it's, it's an incredible computer, and we all have these, and we all carry these around. And the dawn of electronic computing was only about 70 years ago. It's a, sort of arguable when it started, but it really was the result of World War II and geniuses and, and real leaders like John von Neumann and Alan Turing. That was really the dawn of the, elect, the, the electronic computing uh, era. And in that 70 years, this thing is about a billion times more powerful than those original computers. Just think about that. Think about the progress that we've made in the hardware and the software side. It's absolutely outstanding. And sure, there's other things like wireless and networks that make this a really interesting device too, but really it's a computer. And um, we're at the dawn of another era of computing, I believe the era of quantum computing. And we're going to see similar kind of innovations, maybe over the next 70 years, hopefully it'll be quicker than that, that will provide similar kinds of advantages and capabilities and, and, and help humanity change a, a lot of uh, uh, problems that we have today. So what I'd like to do is start off with um, just a little video here. Uh, I probably have to... Uh, switch my deck. Excuse me for a second. So with that, I'd like to go to the video, if that's okay. The control room guy has to do something. Quantum physics Google, puts everything into question. It defies every intuition you have about the natural world. Quantum is a very strange regime of physics. Things can exist in this state of superposition where they could be like ghosting on each other, where they could be this and that at the same time. Entanglement. Quantum entanglement. Two objects, if they're quantum mechanically entangled, are still strongly related to each other, even though they can be a vast distance apart. There's a notion of the multiverse. There's a whole family of Hartmuts in different states and then going through different experiences and different life trajectories. The famous one is quantum tunneling. 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 Tunneling is the slippage between universes. For a long time, people thought those effects only existed in the microscopic domain. Like uh, atoms, electrons, photons. 
but really it's the theory of our universe. So if you want to build a quantum computer, you want to incorporate those new phenomena into information processing. Maybe quantum computation is one of those instruments that's going to allow us to see quantum effects at the human scale. Google and NASA have teamed up to share one of the world's first commercial quantum computers. This machine, made by Canada's D-Wave, will be installed in a NASA research center in California. So that's a little video that was put together by uh, uh, our partner Google. And uh, Google has created the Quantum Artificial Intelligence Center that I'll talk a little bit about as we go along. So what I wanted to do today is basically try to answer as best as I could these, these questions. And as we've seen from the video, there's a lot of jargon and there's a lot of quantum mechanics and some pretty mysterious properties that I'm not really going to be able to do justice in a half an hour or two, but I want to give a sort of layperson's overview of those for you. By the way, I'm not a scientist. I'm, an in, I'm only an engineer by background, so I really am giving you a layperson's view of this. So I'd like to talk about where the original uh, thinking around quantum mechanics and quantum computing came from, and then what really is a quantum computer? What makes a quantum computer? Talk a little bit about how our system works, how the D-Wave system in particular uh, works, and then why do we care? Why do we need more computing power? Who cares about this? And then a little bit about the future. So I'll try to get through it as best as possible. So. Uh, let's go back in time a little bit, and as you, most of you know, quantum mechanics really has been with us for, since about the uh, end of the 19th century to early 20th century. That's when all these great minds like Max Planck and, and Schrodinger and Einstein really developed this, uh, this theory around quantum mechanics, which has become really the best explanation of how nature operates at a most fundamental level. And it was pretty revolutionary at the time. It really still is. I mean, if you, if you, think, you think back to those, those days, the conventional thinking about how the universe worked completely changed. So all the theories, the uh, Newtonian physics and so on, were, were not done away with, but were explained better by, by quantum mechanics. And this all really came about in the, in the early 20th century. So it was an amazing time. Of, uh, of innovation and science and, and led, has led to a lot of the breakthroughs that we all enjoy today. The idea for quantum computing came from one of my favorite physicists, uh, uh, I love reading his books and reading about him, but Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winner. Uh, he conjectured that if one could build a computer using directly leveraging quantum mechanics, that you could really build something that might scale much faster and better than classical computing does, because it uses, I hate to use the word parallelism, but it, it uses, it leverages that inherent parallelism that's in uh, quantum mechanics, and I'll talk more about that as we go along. So if we drill down into recent history, starting with uh, Richard Feynman in 1982, David Deutsch was a, a real thought leader when he described what's called the universal quantum computer, uh, and that's a, a type of quantum computer that can be sort of translated to other types of quantum computing. And then a breakthrough happened in 94 when Peter Shor developed an algorithm uh, without a computer, but he developed the concept of an algorithm and proved that that algorithm could scale dramatically. Uh, it says here quantum code breaking, but really what it does is factor uh, a number into prime, uh, prime numbers, which as you know is the core of all modern cryptography. So this actually got a lot of people's attention when it, mathematically he was able to prove that if someone could build a, such a quantum computer that it would have uh, a, a, an interesting effect, let's say, on, on cryptography in general. So there was a sort of a large investment that came primarily from governments around the world. The U.S. government was a big investor in trying to build uh, quantum computers and do experimentation around quantum computers. Estimates are that uh, the U.S. government has spent probably around a billion dollars uh, uh, in, in quantum computing research since then. Um, and then in, um, uh, shortly after that, five years after that, our company was founded. And this was a, a group of uh, scientists, uh, mostly from the University of British Columbia, that had this idea that they wanted to create a quantum computer and they wanted to be the first to have something that was commercially useful for people. And then really the first five years of the company's existence was really trying to figure out what's the best way to build a quantum computer. There are a lot of different ways I'll, I'll explain, but they, they chose a model that originally came from MIT called the adiabatic quantum computing uh, model. 
and that was developed by Ed Farhi and some of the other scientists at MIT. Um, and then about 10 years later, a 10-year development effort ensued, and we, we released our first commercial computer in 2010. Uh, Lockheed Martin became our first customer. And then we released our second uh, model of computer, uh, coincidentally called D-Wave 2, uh, which uh, we, we have shipped to Google, NASA, Lockheed, and, uh, and uh, um, are about to announce our 1,000 qubit processor later this year. So let's, let's explore what a quantum computer is. So it's a computer that directly leverages quantum mechanics to do a calculation, and, and you know that Quantum mechanics are how transistors work and how lots of other things work, but it's not directly doing the computation. So, um, and uh, the other thing you'll see around quantum computers, they always have a thing called a qubit, a quantum bit. And quantum bits are interesting because they can be zero and one, just like the computing bits that we have today uh, in the classical space. Um, but they can also be in what's called the superposition of zero and one. And our, our English language and our minds really don't understand how can a particle or an object be in two states at the same time. But this is how quantum mechanics works. You can have something that's in a superposition. And that's an interesting party trick if you have one qubit and you get it to, you know, be in those two states at the same time. It only really becomes interesting when you can string them together. And if you string together, say, two to the five, or, or 512 of these qubits, then you can represent a number up to two to the 512, or, or you can represent two to the 512 different states. Two to the 512 is 10 to the 154th power. There's only 10 to the 80th or 90th atoms in the universe. So with 512 of these qubits, you can re represent and search through and process enormous search spaces, and that's kind of that uh, beauty of, of quantum computing. Um, and the, the problem with building a quantum computer and why it's hard is um, they're very sensitive to outside environment. And what I mean by environment, it's any kind of energy or interference to that quantum state. So they're very delicate. Um, and because of that, um, for instance, our system, we've had to create a very extreme environment for the um, system to run in. And when I say extreme, it runs at 0.01 Kelvin. That's minus 273 degrees C. It's 150 times colder than interstellar space. There are no naturally incurred environments like that. It has to be in a magnetic vacuum. It's 50,000 times uh, less of uh, magnetic field than the Earth's magnetic field. It has to operate in a complete vacuum. And this is so that you can have this quantum computation go along without disturbing it. So the project here was, at D-Wave, was really build that environment, build the chip, and then, and then build the software around that. But this is true of any quantum computer. Now there, there, there are three key quantum effects that most scientists look at to prove that something is a quantum computer, and all of these effects have to be um, uh, in, in, in the system, in the quantum system. And the Google video showed a little bit of this. So superposition I already talked about, that you can have a particle or a state or a bit that's in two states at the same time. Um, the second is quantum tunneling, and this is an interesting one. Um, some people say that this is really the connection point between parallel universes. Uh, now, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit uh, off the deep end here, and some people uh, at this point, they, they, they say he's got to be kidding, but if you talk to scientists uh, about the explanation for quantum computing, so how can you have these two bits, this bit, this qubit, that's in those two states at the same time? Well, one explanation, and actually the one that the math works for, is that it's actually in two different universes at the same time. So if you have 512 of these qubits, that's in two to the 512 different universes at the same time. That multiverse theory, which people, you know, poo-pooed in, in, in the 60s when uh, Everett came up with it, is now the best explanation for how quantum mechanics actually works. And quantum tunneling is sometimes thought of the linkage between those different universes. Um, it's also for those of you that may be um, familiar with optimization theory and sort of landscapes in, in the computer science uh, uh, space, it's a way of getting to the lowest energy state as, as uh, easily as possible uh, in, a, in a, a, a landscape. Entanglement is another really interesting property. 
And this one is interesting, and particularly when, when, you, when you talk about communication systems. So that's where you have two uh, qubits or objects that are both, they're quantum mechanical in nature, and they're entangled with each other. You can actually take those objects and move them very far apart, even hundreds of kilometers apart. And when you change the state of one, the other one will change automatically at the, at the same time simultaneously. No one quite understands how that happens, but there have been experiments that have shown that. And this isn't directly related to quantum computing, but in the telecommunication space, it's a, it's a, a rich area of exploration for future uh, communication systems, and especially secure communication systems. But entanglement also goes on in the heart of a, a quantum computer. So how do you build a quantum computer? There's, a, there, there's, there's both the theory or the, the method that you use, and that, that I'll call the model, and there's the basis or the implementation of how you do that. Uh, and the most popular quantum uh, computing model is called the gate model, and if, if many of you uh, have had quantum mechanics courses, you probably have learned the gate model. And it's basically developing gates, the digital equipment, you know, the digital gates that are the sort of fundamental building block of all computers today, building quantum equivalents of those. And it makes total sense to, to do that. The problem is it's extremely difficult to implement, and the most complex quantum computer that's ever been built has factored the number 21. Sort of knowing what those factors are ahead of time is really a laboratory experiment more than anything. So it's very, very difficult to implement the gate model. The adiabatic or the annealing model, which is the model that D-Wave chose, was the, came out of theory from MIT, as I mentioned. There's one way, there's topological, uh, actually Microsoft is doing a lot of uh, research on topological quantum computing, which is a very elegant approach, theoretically, but it will require the discovery of a particle called a non-abelian anion, which no physicist has actually seen. But once that particle is discovered, then we can start thinking about how you're gonna build hardware to harness that and so on. So that's probably a couple decades away, at least from, uh, from practicality, but it's an interesting model, certainly. And then there's the basis. How do you actually implement these? So one of the most common methods is with superconducting metals. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, we operate, and many other folks in the quantum computing research space operate at these very, very low temperatures. And those metals become superconductors at those low temperatures. It's a very quiet environment that doesn't disturb that, uh, that, the, that quantum computing um, uh, calculation that goes on. That's what we chose to do, and we do that with um, super, superconducting metals, but we use semiconductor manufacturing technology. So we build them on wafers the same way that semiconductors are, are built to, the same way that Intel builds their processors and so on. You can also do ion traps, photons. Um, uh, Dave Wineland, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in physics a couple of years ago for first quantum computing research, um, uses ion traps. So those are all valid methods. So the D-Wave computer, the way this, this, this works is you basically map your problem onto what you could consider a landscape. So if you think of a, a two-dimensional landscape, say a mountain terrain, and the problem you're trying to solve can be represented by finding the lowest valley in that, in that terrain. And it's a well-known computer science problem. It's actually an NP-hard, it's a so-called NP-hard problem. It's a really hard problem to go around and find that lowest uh, energy point or that lowest part in the terrain. So that's called an optimization problem. Many of you are probably familiar with optimization theory. Um, and typically today what people do is they use heuristics to do that. So they'll, they'll, they'll try sort of clever algorithms that will um, sort of use the, the structure of the mountains and try to determine where those, um, where those valleys are. But you very typically can get stuck in a, what's called a local minimum and not find the global minimum, what, what is really the lowest part of that landscape. So though that sounds very obscure, that's really the machine language of what this system does, of what the D-Wave system does. It basically can solve that particular problem and find that lowest energy solution in a, in a very short amount of time, actually in one clock cycle, if you will. And w one way of thinking about what it's doing when it's doing that calculation is it's really exploring this answer space of two to the 512, 512 because we have 512 qubits, two to the 512 different possible answers and finding the best answer from that range. And again, that's 10 to the 154th power. It's an enormous number. 
And as we make progress on the number of qubits, we'll go to two to the thousand, four thousand, whatever it may be, those numbers get exponentially larger. And that's where this incredible uh, explosion in capability and processing power comes from. The, it, the downside to it is it, it is probabilistic. All quantum mechanics and quantum, uh, quantum computers are probabilistic in nature. So it doesn't always get the right answer, but it will give you a probabilistic distribution of what the right answers are, sorted by uh, optimality. So why would people care about this uh, at all? And uh, you know, a couple, of, a couple of comments there. One, there are a lot of problems um, in, in mankind that are limited by the amount of computer power that we can put toward them. And these typically are problems that are in the um, complexity class of exponential. So they scale at some exponent of the number of variables. And these are, you know, those of you that went, uh, took computer science classes remember these, these types of problems, traveling salesperson problems, optimization problems, things like that. They all scale with the number of variables, the amount of complexity very dramatically. And it's those types of problems at the core um, that quantum computers can solve very well. And I'll talk about where, where we see some of those problems. But the other way of thinking about this is this is the first time that a computer has leveraged directly the laws of quantum mechanics and taken this different approach than all the computing that's been going on for the last 70 years, which has brought us an am amazing set of revolutions. But now we can build computers that leverage that classical, those classical techniques, but also for the right types of applications can apply quantum mechanics to them to do calculations even faster and more accurately not for all of computing, but for a really interesting particular set of problems. And the reason I say this is the last computing frontier is, as far as we know in physics, there isn't any other theory of the universe. It's classical and it's quantum. And those are the two theories that we, we build upon, and quantum mechanics describes both classical and, and quantum. So this really is the first attempt to build technology that can leverage this, this new way of thinking that was developed in the early 20th century by those great scientists and take advantage of that capability. The other way to think about this is this is how nature computes. Nature is doing quantum mechanical calculations all around us all the time. The problem is how do you tap into that? How do you take advantage of that capability? They're going on in our minds, they're going on in this podium, they're going on everywhere all the time. It's how nature optimizes. So the key challenges toward to building a quantum computer um, that uh, that everyone needs to go through when they're when they're trying to build quantum computers is first deciding the approach that you're going to take because it's a greenfield opportunity. And you know, in the beginning of uh, classical computing, there were a lot of different methods uh, that were explored and and and, and so on. Um, and it's a little bit like those early days of computing. I remember there were, there were even, probably no one here remembers it, but there were even people that were building pneumatic computers out of air pressure, uh, believe it or not, analog type computers. So there were a lot of different types of technologies and realizations that were, were explored before this, that, you know, before the world became CMOS, semiconductors, and, and uh, stored program von Neumann machines that we, we, we enjoy today. So the approach, those, those different types of uh, theories are, one has to select which is gonna be the best. And D-Wave chose the adiabatic approach, which has turned out to be the right decision because it's, um, no one else has been able to implement any type of quantum computer and, uh, and uh, we're on our, our second and, and, and soon third generation. Um, you also have to build that extreme operating environment. So you've got to build this, you know, very rarefied apparatus that'll run this chip down at these very low temperatures and these magnetic vacuums, get the signals in and out without disturbing the quantum effects that are going on within that, that computer. And that's a huge engineering challenge. And you, you saw the picture of a, a, a D-Wave system there. It's a huge box. And in that box uh, is all this shielding in this refrigerator, this exotic refrigerator to get the temperature down all to power this one chip that's about the size of your fingernail. That superconducting chip is only that uh, a centimeter squared. Um, so that environment uh, is, uh, is a big part of the project and is, um, uh, it's necessary in, uh, in any type of uh, quantum computing uh, implementation. Then um, 
manufacturing sometimes sounds boring, but it's important to understand how you would build processors to scale. And we made the choice that we would leverage semiconductor manufacturing so we can build these quantum chips just like Intel and other leaders in the semiconductor industry build their chips. So we've had um, two production generations and we can every year or so come out with our next generation and, and hopefully continue along that path that, uh, that Intel and others have done since, uh, in Intel's case, probably since the 70s, the mid-70s when they came out with their first microprocessors. Um, uh, then the other um, thing that, that is necessary, and uh, we're, we're a startup company, um, but we're also very engaged in the scientific community. And because quantum computing is such a new field, it's important that we share information, that we participate in the, uh, the, the quantum computing science that goes on. So as a company, we've published 60 peer-reviewed papers. Um, I don't think there's a... a, a startup company in history that's published anything near that. In fact, I'm trying to find a startup company that's published one peer-reviewed science paper. If you know of one, come talk to me about it. But I think that's necessary for the kind of advanced work that a company like V-Wave is doing, um, to share that, to help move the field forward. Sure, we have our own, uh, we have a huge patent portfolio and a lot of IP and a lot of know-how on how to do this, but the fundamental science, we want to participate and help move forward. Um, the other issue uh, that I haven't talked a lot about is the software. And um, the software, as you can imagine, is different than classical computing. Um, the, the machine language, is, as I mentioned earlier, of the machine is very different than the machine language that I grew up in, uh, you know, when you were toggling bootloaders into, into, into machines or the assembly language at the very lowest level of, of, of programming today. So um, the compilers and the other tool sets that are available in the classical computing world aren't available in the, the quantum computing side. And it very much depends on the model that you're using. So these are things that are under construction by us and some of our partners. Um, and it's important to also find the right problem set to, to, to focus the computer on because as I said, it's not general purpose computing. It's something that you wanna use alongside classical computing and use it for what it's best at. So let's talk a little bit about examples of some of the problems that um, a computer like this can, can help in. And again, think of this more as a coprocessor in a network rather than a replacement for quantum computing. If you have a problem that's very complex and you wanna offload that in a way, it'll be available in the cloud as a quantum computing resource. I think in, the f in five years' time, you know, if you're an iOS developer and you have a clever thing that you want to do uh, on, your, on your iOS phone, call the Quantum Cloud, which we will provide, either directly or through our partners, and you can use a quantum computer to provide that calculation. I doubt you will ever have a quantum computer inside this phone because of some of those uh, uh, environmental considerations that I talked about. But certainly with the emergence of, of, of cloud, you can have this be, uh, we can have this be a ubiquitous service that's available to, to the whole world. So some of the specific applications that, that, that we work on now, I'll start with the health field. Uh, we work with a, a startup called DNA Seek, who's developed a really interesting um, uh, diagnostic technique for, for cancer. Um, and what they basically do is they take genomic data that for, for these patients, and these patients are in the last stage of cancer, so a very serious uh, situation. And they develop through a crystallographer, uh, crystallography library that they have the best matching drugs um, that are in this category called kinase inhibitor to shut down the, the, the what's, what's driving the cancer. Um, and that's a very complex uh, combinatorial problem. And actually, we use a machine learning technique to do that. I'll talk a little bit more about machine learning, but most of you are probably familiar with that. Um, and, and to find those drugs that will work best for, for that particular patient. So you could say this is sort of personalized medicine. They've already had three cases where they've had uh, uh, patients that are in terminal stages of cancer into remission because of this, this, uh, this algorithm that, that they developed. So very interesting. Um, uh, important application. We also work with a company called OneQubit that's developing financial services algorithms for use in this computer. Um, and, you know, as you know, uh, Wall Street and financial uh, services institutions 
want to do better modeling of risk um, uh, and understand the, the implications of changes in the market and what will happen to their balance sheet or pricing securities or exotic securities or whatever they are. Those are very complex problems. They're typically done by something called Monte Carlo simulation today. In fact, when I was at Goldman, that was the number one computing workload in the firm. Um, they uh, have now hundreds of thousands of cores that do nothing but run uh, Monte Carlo simulations. And uh, every financial services firm does a, a similar amount to, to, to do these so-called value at risk calculations. So one qubit is doing a lot in the portfolio modeling and the analysis side. Uh, and they're, they're a good partner for us. Um, the, the other one I'll talk about is in the, in the general computing space, Google. Google, um, as I said, installed uh, the machine uh, that you saw earlier at uh, the NASA Ames facility. Uh, so it's a partnership between Google and NASA uh, to do uh, exploration of quantum computing. And Google's aim is to use quantum computing particularly for machine learning. Uh, and machine learning, as you know, is probably one of the most interesting things going on in, uh, in computer science today. It's sort of like AI 2.0, rebranded re AI, an enormous set of uh, applications. Uh, you'll hear about Watson uh, later on, but uh, you know all the leaders like Google and, uh, and, and, and others are, are using machine learning for all of their core businesses, optimizing search, optimize, doing image search, mining big data, all of those kinds of things. So that's the exploration area for Google. And we actually uh, are very bullish on machine learning too and do, do a lot of work in that, in that space also. And then NASA uh, is doing things like looking for exoplanets. So um, they have an enormous amount of data that comes from Voyager and other, uh, other um, space uh, objects or spacecraft that they've had over the years that have so much data that they could look at to try to find uh, exoplanets. And one of the goals of NASA is to try to find exoplanets that are in this sort of Goldilocks zone that could have life upon them and, and, and discover uh, life in, in, in other solar systems, which uh, personally I think is, is, is pretty cool and exciting. That again is a, is a, a big data, to use a broad term, a big data application. Uh, and, and machine learning or optimization techniques are very applicable toward, toward, toward those kinds of things. So those are a handful of applications for quantum computing, but it will be much broader than that. And we're just at the very early stages of trying to figure out where these best fits are in working with partners like Google and NASA and Lockheed and others to, 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 to figure out the best way to use this, this kind of um, revolutionary technology. So where is the, the, the future going? Um, there will be others. We, weren't, we obviously will not be the only company in, in history to, do, to build a quantum computer, but we do think that we have a significant lead on anyone else at this point. Um, but it will be a powerful new resource that can be considered in your computing mix over the next decade. Um, and you'll see, you'll have access to systems like this uh, through the cloud uh, on, uh, bought on a time-shared basis rather than having to put a, a large D-Wave system in, into your data center. So it'll be ubiquitous. We eventually want to uh, provide the tools and the capabilities so that developers all over the world can use this capability to come up with clever algorithms and new use cases for this, uh, for this new capability. Um, so I think it will be a, a very exciting decade uh, in, as we move forward in quantum computing. It's complementary to classical computing. Classical computing does a lot of things very well, uh, and amazingly well. Um, so that you shouldn't think about this as a replacement for, for classical computing. Although it could replace the way some applications within classical computing are, are done. For instance, that Monte Carlo simulation that I talked about. That's kind of a brute force way of, of doing that particular problem. There are more elegant ways to do that with classical computing that I think will emerge and, and become very popular. Um, we talked about cloud access, the, uh, but one thing that will emerge and, and is very important is the building of a software ecosystem around quantum computing. And this is a very important point. What, what we have now is effectively a raw processor. It's, it's sort of its first generation. Sometimes I think about this as a little like, um, if you go back to uh, the beginning of Intel, they had this microprocessor called, the, I think it was the 4004 a uh, four-bit microprocessor that was used in uh, cash registers, and then they came out with the 8080, the eight-bit microprocessor. 
which really was the first kind of personal computer, if you will, and it was geeks like me that played around with those kind of computers in those days. And there were a couple of other geeks, these guys Paul Allen and Bill Gates, who basically wrote the first basic compiler for that, uh, for that hardware that was really hard to use. You had to program in assembly language at a very low level. But that really was the dawn of the age of personal computing. And uh, in, the, in, in the intermediate decades, it's been uh, pretty exciting what's happened there. We're almost back at that very early stage where that software ecosystem that was similar to the one that was started by, uh, by uh, Microsoft's first product there, that's where we are and that's what we're gonna do over the next few years. So that consists of developer tools, it consists of algorithms, reference cases, a whole software development kit and, and, and so on that people can use to, to, uh, to build with this kind of computer. So at D-Wave, we're, we're really working to radically change the perception around uh, quantum computer and the idea that for some of these very complex problems, the ones that I mentioned, that we're sort of at the limit of what supercomputers and, and classical computers can do. Um, and really about trying to um, work with the scientific community and the developer community so that they can harness these um, quantum computing architectures to really use it as a tool to help solve these very important problems for mankind. And these problems are really huge. I mean, if you think about the problems that are, could benefit from uh, more quantum, uh, more computing technology, they, they're all over the place. They're in climate modeling, they're in water distribution, they're in curing cancer, better drug development, they're in modeling risk better for financial uh, institutions things like that, that are human scale, hard problems to solve, that I, I, I'm convinced, and uh, I hope you'll see in, in your lifetime, the direct impact of quantum computing on how it can help some of those um, human scale problems. So thank you, that's uh, a quick overview of, of, of quantum, uh, quantum computing. All right. I mean, if you can hang, let's open it up for Q&A to talk about quantum computing. Yes. Yeah. It's a very small company. It's a startup company called DNA Seek, and basically what they're doing is taking that genomic data, which is now much more available. Actually, taking um, genomic data for patients, individuals, so they, they, individual patient gets sequenced. And then they take that data and then they match it against a, a drug library that they have to find the correct kinase inhibitor. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a drug that is used to inhibit cancer. And there are all these permutations that they have to go through to find the best match. So it's this combination of genomics and, and this data of molecules, drug molecules, to find that uh, best therapy, drug therapy. So they actually make a recommendation for the oncologist, here's uh, the regime that you, should, uh, that you should use. What they hope to do is actually take that data and then work with drug companies to, to rescue, the so-called rescue orphan drugs, drugs that um, you know, didn't work or, 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 or weren't allowed for a particular testing reason or they had a bad result or something, but find those genetic populations where, where they may work well. Um, particularly in oncology and these kinase inhibitors is, is the focus of this particular company. All right, other questions in the middle section? Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, let me, let me, just a clarification. It, you're asking why we're different than the academic community, or what's? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so that, that was actually one of the insights of the original founders. And they were a bit frustrated 
that there was a lot of research, great research in quantum computing, but it wasn't really resulting in anything that was practically useful. And even that, and that was in 1999 when they made that decision. Even today, there is no other quantum computer that is doing real calculations. There are laboratory experiments and things that have been shown that it can work, but no one actually has built a computer um, that's commercially useful. So, so it sounds like a simple insight, but the original founders, what they decided was that they, they wanted to tap into venture capital. They wanted to have a sustained effort so that I mean, one of the things that's hard in academia is you're struggling for funding. You're looking for those grants all the time, and it's very hard to have a sustained effort where you're building something like this. So th this is sort of like a mini Manhattan project where we brought scientists from all over the world that are the best in this capability and, and, and really have them focused on building, first and foremost, something that scientists and, and, and computer scientists, application developers can use to solve real problems. And as a side effect, as a, a very important side effect, we also publish papers and we participate in the, in the uh, scientific community too. But the, the, the goal of D-Wave is, is to build something that is most useful for, for the commu community. Um, so it sounds simple, but there were a few of those founding principles that the, the founders used here. One was use of semiconductor manufacturing, building it as a chip, the other was this, this choice of model, this so-called adiabatic computing model, which has proven to be a, a good choice. And then the other was go out and raise venture capital, find those visionary investors who are willing to invest in a long-term effort. And by the way, there's not a whole lot out there that do that. Most investors, most venture capital investors are looking for the two-year social website kind of you know, quick hit investment. One, one thing that I'm, I am disappointed in the venture capital community, not so much from a D-Way perspective, because we got through somehow, but is the lack of science-based investment. And that's something that I think will help move us forward as, 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 as humans if we can get more venture capital focused on building things that have science at their core rather than, you know, pardon my expression, but cool websites or whatever. I'm, I'm inspired in listening to you. Maybe I should quit my own job. Uh, <laughs> next question, right here in front. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, if you wouldn't mind repeating the question, sure. Got, I'm uh, sorry. People on the live. So, the question is: um, do, do I have any thoughts about what will happen with Bitcoin and other forms of encryption as uh, quantum computing um, gets implemented? Well, first off, um, our focus is not on factoring uh, numbers. We're not uh, focused on cryptography. That's not the market that we're going after. Well, having said that, you know, you can use this kind of computer for that. But by our projections, it's, it's probably decades before there's a vulnerability in any of the, the, the types of uh, modern encryption that we use today. And those will, of course, get better. And there are um, academic efforts um, around, there's a thing called post-quantum cryptography. So people are thinking about once quantum computers are prevalent, how do we change uh, cryptography? And there's nothing sacred about factoring prime numbers. It's just the only reason that was chosen, uh, in fact, you don't factor prime numbers, doing prime factorization or, or factoring a number into primes. The only reason that was chosen is the core of cryptography because it's a really hard problem. Well, you can find other really hard problems either, even for quantum computers, and that's probably what will happen over time. I won't comment on Bitcoin at all. That's a <laughs> <laughs> it's not like this is on record. Uh, <laughs> two, probably time for two more questions. The KC shirt over there. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, so um, we don't get to zero, zero Kelvin. It's theoretically not possible to get to zero Kelvin. We get to 0 0.01 millikelvin. It's sort of an asymptote. You can get down very close to it, but you, you can't actually get to zero Kelvin. And we use an, a, a fairly exotic uh, refrigerator. It's, we call it a fridge. It uh, it's a, uh, uses a uh, mix of helium, uh, liquid helium, two different isotopes of helium. It's called a pulse tube dilution refrigerator. And you can actually buy one. Uh, there's two vendors that we work with to, to, to basically customize their products for our system. Uh, they're about a half a million dollars a piece, but you, you, you can buy them. Um, 
so that's how we get down to, to that low temperature. And uh, the lower the temperature, by the way, the better it com uh, uh, computes. That technology will get better over time um, and probably we'll, we'll be able to shrink this into, um, right now it's three data center size racks and there's this big box. It'll probably be four data center size racks and you could really put it in any data center and so on. But your other question, the other part of your question is very interesting where this machine, although it, the, the, it, the refrigerator is exotic, it doesn't use a lot of heat or, or generate, uh, it doesn't use a lot of power. It uses about 15 kilowatts of power, which is nothing compared to the data center loads that, that I'm familiar with in, 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 in most data centers today. It's about a rack of servers or half a rack of servers. And as the computer scales, because it's a superconducting uh, processor implementation, it adds no additional power. So as the world moves to quantum computing implementations like D-Wave, there'll be a huge energy savings in these data centers because it uses these uh, superconducting metals and superconducting technologies. So if we have a billion qubit chip that's you know, doing this amazing amount of calculation, it'll still use 15 kilowatts of power. In fact, we could probably jam a lot of chips into that same payload and still use that 15 kilowatts of power. So it'll have a dramatic uh, effect on energy usage in data centers, which is like the, I think the number two uh, user of electricity in the world right now is data centers. Thanks. All right, we probably have time for one more question. I think in the middle section on the far right, left. Yeah, well, that, that, that's a great question. I'm not an expert on, uh, on, on uh, quantum, uh, it's called, called teleportation, but I can give you a brief um, synopsis of some of the things that are going on. So that, that characteristic, what you're, what you're referring to around entanglement is, is very interesting, especially across distances. So this, uh, you know, you can imagine that if you have a quantum mechanical system and it's separated by this distance and you can change you know, the, the state of that system here and it automatically changes at, at any distance, theoretically any distance, uh, that, that, that's a pretty important thing. Now, it still has all of the, the, the difficulty is that it, you have to keep that whole quantum mechanical system um, away from that environment. So it's a very fragile kind of thing. But there have been experiments, I think up to a thousand kilometers, where they've actually demonstrated that kind of capability. The other part that's very interesting about that is because of this, um, uh, this, this nature of when you, when you look at a quantum computer, this is uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, when you look at a quantum mechanical object, uh, and this isn't exactly what happens, but when you, when you read it out, it actually destroys the quantum mechanical state, it freezes it out. And really what that's about is just your, it's an environment, the process of even reading it out it introduces the environment and it becomes classical. So you can use these, um, these systems, you could imagine you could build them into communication systems where you would really know if anybody else intercepted that communication. It would be a secure channel because if it, it got over here and it actually changed the quantum state, you knew nobody else along the way actually could, could, could look at that. So there are quantum cryptography implementations where people are using that effect um, for uh, key uh, uh, usage and, and distribution and things like that. So that's, gonna, that, that's another area of not so much quantum computing, but uh, leveraging quantum mechanics and quantum information theory that, that, that'll be interesting over the next decade. Good question. I feel like I could listen to you for hours. This is pretty fascinating stuff. Let's give it up for Vern Bernal, CEO of D-Wave.